So we're in First Thessalonians overview, and let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we're back. Jesus, we're back. Yay, women singing, women worshiping, women in the word. It's, it's amazing, your faithfulness in our lives. We give you this time now. We pray that you, we could just confess any sin that we are holding in our lives or in our hearts, that we would um, be repentant, that we would give that to you, that you would be faithful and just to forgive us all our sins, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, to fill us with your Holy Spirit, to teach us your word, to give us wisdom and insight and application, that we will leave here as changed women, that we would go out in the world and represent Jesus to the world and bring you glory, Father. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's just an overview. I'm going to try real hard to stay in my lane. So if you think, well, why didn't you go there? Because I'm trying to stay in my overview lane. It's an overpass over all of the chapters. So first and second, our first Thessalonians and Galatians were the first letters that Paul wrote. They are considered the oldest books in the New Testament. So when you read through the chronological Bible, it puts Galatians in there with Acts because even though Jesus' ministry and the, gospel, the gospels happened first, the first books that were written were Thessalonians and Galatians. The, the gospels were written later. So even though chronologically they come later, they were written first. And to me, that was something I didn't know before, that I just assumed the book, you know, you kind of think the books in the Bible were just written in the order that they're put in there. Like, who decided this was the order? Well, they said that Paul's books come first after the Gospels, then Acts, and then Paul's books, and then they're in there by how long they are. So, but I know God has a plan. And God put them there on purpose. I mean, he must have put it in man's mind to say, okay, this is the order I want them. But 1 Thessalonians and Galatians were written first. They were written, Paul wrote this letter to the believers in the city of Thessalonica. It's still thriving today as a Greek city of Thessaloniki. It has a population of over 800,000 people. Can you imagine the city that Paul walked in, the city that he um, established a church in? Is That city is still functioning to this day. It, was a, it is a port city. It's not only a port city in Greece, but it has major highways going through it. So what better what place to plant a church than uh, that when you want the gospel to go out, but then in a church that has a port that takes the gospel out to sea, has a highway that takes it out to all the different cities. It was a perfect place to plant a seed to start a church. This was established, Paul went to Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. I don't know if you remember, but there was a first missionary journey that he and Barnabas went on, and then they were going to go on a second missionary journey, and Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, but John Mark had left him the first time, and Paul was like, not taking him, he abandoned us, we can't trust him. And Barnabas is like, because he's the son of encouragement, let's give him another try. Paul's like, no, I'm taking Silas, and then so he took Silas and went one way, and Barnabas took took John Mark and went another way, and along the way, Paul and Silas, or Silvanus, it's interchangeable, picked up Timothy on the way. So Paul and Silvanus, Silas, and Timothy end up in Thessalonica. That's where we are, okay? <laughs> so it went like this when they got there, Acts 17. And now they passed through, oh, and then I got to tell you this too. Right before this, they had been in Philippi. Remember that story, how um, he went to Philippi and he preached the gospel and they got beat up and put in jail and they were worshiping God while they were in chains and the chains broke and the earthquake came and the jailer was gonna kill himself because he thought they were gonna escape. And Paul's like, don't kill yourself, don't kill yourself. And he shares the gospel with them and the Philippian jailer accepts the Lord, him and all his household. And then Paul had to leave. So that just happened. And now he's in Thessalonica, chapter 17. Now when they passed through Amphipolis and Ampollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. 
But when the Jews who were not persuaded became envious, he took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they ja dragged Jason and some brethren to the city, to rulers of the city, crying out, those who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Even the unbelievers acknowledge that the gospel of Jesus Christ was turning the world upside down. And Jason has harbored them. And these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And then they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So the security, it is thought, meant that Jason paid money to guarantee that Paul would leave and he wouldn't come back, which is why um, 1 Thessalonians, the letter, takes place, because Paul, having established this church, and some people say it had to be longer because you can't have this kind of bond that Paul has with these people only after three weeks. But the Bible says he, he taught in the synagogue for three weeks. And I'm telling you, I met some people, I met a woman this morning named Jerry that I felt a bond with. And if I spent three weeks with her, I would think I'd feel even a better and a greater bond. So I think God can work that. So he spent three weeks in Thessalonica, and so then this is what's happening. He believed, or he felt towards them, it says in chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes, cherishes her, her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Paul felt towards them as a nursing mother, cherishing her own children. And he was concerned about what was happening because they had to leave so abruptly. So now what he's doing, he's sending Timothy back to see. So now what he did was he sent Timothy back to see how they were doing. And after being away, they send Timothy back. So Timothy goes, he checks out and sees how everybody's doing. Then he comes back and he tells Paul they're doing really well. They're suffering persecution. They've got some questions, but they are preaching and loving and their love is going out to all of Macedonia. And Paul says, that is so cool. I'm going to write him a letter. Now we get to the letter. You got it? So he went on a journey. He went to Thessalonica, he set up a church, he got kicked out, he was curious how they were doing, so now he sent Timothy, Timothy comes back, says they're doing really well, now he's writing the letter. The letter is an amazing little letter for five, having five chapters, and you can look at it in three parts. You can have the past in verses in chapters 1 through 2 about them becoming believers and all that Paul had invested in them and all that Timothy had told him about them and how they were growing and what they were doing. It's the past, but he's looking at it as their faith. Having had faith, this is what God is doing in your life. And in the middle, it talks about the future. They had questions, where do believers go when they, when they die? They were thinking that Jesus would return in their lifetime, but now people were under persecution and being killed and they were dying and they're wondering, oh no, what happens? Are they gonna miss out because they've died? And so Paul addresses that question, what happens when believers die and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the hope that we have, the hope of the future. And then he talks about their present, their, their love, the Thessalonian love, living as believers. So in the last chapters, it's living life. Now that you're believers, now that you're established with hope, how are you going to then live? And he gives them instruction and encouragement and things to do while they're waiting. As far as themes go, it's kind of like a theme park called Faith, Hope, and Love Land. So if you could imagine Disneyland, it's got frontier land and fantasy land and the different lands. Well, Thessalonians has different themes within it. And each set of theme could be like taking this whole time that we're going to be spending in one book. We could just take one theme and go through it. And then we could take another theme and go through it. So when I was looking it up, these are some of the themes. Apologetics, ecclesiastical, pastoral, eschatological, and missionary. Whew, right over my head there. 
those things are too high for me, so I'm going to stick with faith, hope, and love. The past, the future, and the present. Paul encourages them. He commends them on their faith. He gives them hope in the death of a believer and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he instructs them on continuing to live and grow in love. The other night, this noise started happening. I thought somebody was lawn mowing at like 8 o'clock at night. But it was the ice maker in that room. The whole room started shaking. So the babies are nothing compared to that ice machine in that room over there. (laughs) Just saying. Had babies been there, done that, don't bother me. So, in fact, I have a new baby granddaughter, and she cries, and I think it's sweet. And her mom's like, oh, oh, I'll get her to be quiet. No, no, I love it when she cries. <laughs> Everything about her is sweet. So she's only like a month and a half old. I'm, I'm all in with this baby. And I can see where Paul feels all in with these people, like a mother nursing. I'm like a grandmother that just is all in with this baby. So anyway, in believing, let's take the faith part first. They received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So I know sometimes you think when you accept the Lord, everything's going to be all better. I even had somebody say one time, this is not what I thought it would be. And I was like, well, maybe you should come to my church because my church teaches this is what it is. The reality of being a Christian is it's a difficult road. But the reality of Christianity, Christianity is the joy of the Holy Spirit who gives us joy while we're enduring the suffering that conforms us into the image of Jesus. We're so surprised when we say, oh, Lord, make me like Jesus. And then you remember, okay, Jesus came. He suffered, and he died, and he rose again. So the suffering is part of it. You know what? We don't really learn in good times. When was the last time you really learned a really good lesson other than cake tastes really good? But then you learn the lesson that has repercussions. You know what? Hard times, they're, they're there. But God gives us joy, joy unexplainable in the midst of suffering. Their faith in God had gone forth everywhere, out to the sea, through the pathways, their, their faith was made known to these people. And even with the town, they recognized the change. They didn't like the change, but they recognized the change in these people. They had made a radical choice in that they had turned from idols to serve the living and true God. They had turned away from the past, turned away from the things that had held them before, turned away from the the thought police, the thoughts that you had to be a certain way, that you had to certain do a certain thing, that you had to sacrifice to this God. And they had to learn to the true and living God, made a radical decision, a commitment in their lives. They were waiting from the sun from heaven. Verse chapter 110 says, they're waiting for Jesus. All this living, all this doing is with that expectant hope that Jesus is coming. And he's coming, ladies. He is. And we are just living through some times nobody would have ever expected it would have gotten to this. I think if the Thessalonians were here now, they'd be shocked by what is going on. It's crazy. But they have hope. The hope in his coming, and that's what Paul wants to give to them. That he want, they wanted to know what happened, and Paul's going to tell them. So I'm not going to go through this part, but I'm just going to tell you that Paul teaches on the deliverance from the coming wrath. He teaches that in um, chapter 1, verse 10, and chapter 5, verse 9. That we're to wait from the Son from heaven, whom God raised from the dead. Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. He wanted them to have that hope. Then he assures them not only of Christ's return, but of the personal nature of Christ's return, of holiness and sanctification and hope and, again, joy. It's a personal return. He says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Is it not you? When Christ comes, Paul is going to be blessed by the fact that these believers had come to know the Lord and were were there because of the ministry that God had worked through him. It's personal in nature. When Jesus comes, it's not just a group thing that is like, all, okay, all y'all come this way. He knows us individually. He knows what we've done. He knows how we've suffered. He knows how much we love him. He knows all of this. And when he comes, it's going to be personal. Jesus is coming for each one of us personally. It's not a group effort. It's personal, and Paul wanted them to know that. 
He says, so that he may establish your hearts blameless and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Blameless and holiness. This is what he wants. This is what he assures them. If you keep walking, you keep choosing, you keep doing what God has called you to do. When Jesus comes, he will raise you blameless and holy within Christ Jesus. It's his holiness, his blamelessness that we are raised in. He has forgiven our sins, cleansed them away. And what God sees is the holiness of Jesus when he comes for us. He says, when we declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. So he's saying that that it's not like the dead in Christ are going to be dead and then we're going to come, but the dead in Christ are going to rise first and the Lord's going to come and we're all going to meet him in the air. And I can't say I have a total grasp on that because, again, it's something we don't know, but we'll get it when it happens. We'll get it. It'll be fine. God's got us covered, and someone else is going to go down that lane better for you. <laughs> and he informs them of the rapture of the church in chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. So we got those middle chapters. So we got the beginning, the believing in faith, and then the middle, the hope and the coming of Jesus Christ. And then we have the last couple chapters that talks about love, living as mature believer. He prays for them. He instructs them. He commends them, and he requests of them to respect one another and to respect those that are over them and to be at peace one with another. Now, I don't know if these were things that Timothy told him were going on. You know, they're not respecting the people over them or they're not living at peace or whether these are just things, these are standard things he wants them to know. You need to respect one another, respect the people over you, and be at peace one with another. He says in chapter 3, verse 12, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love one for another for all all as we do you. And then he says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. That's why we're here. We're encouraging one another. We're building one another. We're fulfilling Paul's command to the Thessalonians in our own very lives by being here right now. He says, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Their love was made known. If there's one thing our church wants to be made known for, one is that we stand on the word of God. The word of God is um, true and right and faithful, and we stand on it for every decision we make, and we want to be known for the love that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ for all the brethren and the people in the community. He says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. He wants them to treat one another well and, again, respect those over them. Sometimes it's difficult to respect the person over you, and I have learned it's because I don't see life the way they see it. God has given them the wisdom, the knowledge, the insight in order to lead us. And he hasn't given it to us. And it even goes in our own households with our husbands. God speaks to our husbands. And sometimes we don't get it. And we don't see it. But we need to trust the Lord that he is true and faithful. And he says your husband is the head over you. And that you need to submit to him. Because God speaks to him and he speaks to you. Not in a weird way, just in a perfect way of someone's got to be in charge. If you don't have someone in charge, people fight. And so God makes the man in charge because he created the man first and then he created the woman over him. And we're safe there. We can get ourselves out, but I'm telling you, the safest place is being to the authority of your husband. Because when God speaks, he speaks to him. And if you're over here, then he's got to deal with you about those issues too. You want to be up under there. And if your, your husband has died or passed away, you're under the authority of the pastor of the church. He'll protect you. He'll help you make decisions. He'll, or the, the authority of a small group leader. God will help you in that situation and protect you. His job, God's desire is to protect you, not to abuse you. Jesus was the greatest liberator of women ever. And we are safe within his word. Okay, having said that, we're going to come to the conclusion. Here's some points to ponder. Look for instruction. The book is full of instructions, such as aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we have instructed you to. He's full of things that he tells them to do. 
When you don't know what to do, do what you know is right to do. And so he's telling you, live quietly and to mind your own business and to work with your hands. Because when you work with your hands, you're busy. And if your hands are busy, usually your mouth is not. And it's good for us. Look for commands, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. It's a command. He's saying, I want you to admonish those who are not doing anything to get up and do something. Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. With as much as within you, be patient with all men. And this is a command, and there's lots of commands. That's just one of them. Look for the will of God. In chapter 515, he says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I don't know how many times I've thought, I just want the will of God. I just want to do the will of God. God, I don't know your will. So just tell me what your will is, and I'll do that. Well, here's what he's saying. Here's his will. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, be thankful, because this is his will. So whatever your situation that you are in, and sometimes circumstances can be kind of dire, what does he want you to do? What's his will? To rejoice. Not that someone's hurting you or that you're in pain, but rejoice that you know that God's got this covered, that he is faithful, that he is going to work this for you good. Keep promises he's faithful, and that all things, all things will work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose to conform us into the image of Christ Jesus. It's just not that everything works together for good. The next verse says to conform us into the image of Jesus. He's faithful. Look for his will. And here it is. There are other places where he'll say, and this is the will of God for you. Look for seeds of thought. This was my favorite part. It's like in this first letter, he has this little seed of thought. And he'll say something that you'll know he expounds on later in a different book. So he says in chapter 1, verse 3, and we pray to our God and Father about you. We th think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and the enduring hope that you have because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he talks to them about love. So you have faith, hope, and love. And in 1 Corinthians, he does a whole chapter 13 on love. That love is a choice. Love is not an emotion. And these are the choices that you make when you love. And he concludes that with, but faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So he takes a little seed of thought, faith, hope, and love, and he turns it into this huge, monumental um, teaching that changes our lives about love. Then he says in chapter 5, but let those who live in the night be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation, the whole armor of God. It's just a little bitty thought right there, the helmet of salvation. But in Ephesians chapter 6, he turns it into the full armor of God. And in here he says, in Thessalonians, a couple places, he'll say, and stand therefore. And in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, stand therefore, stand firm, stand. And then he goes on with the full armor of God and how each piece has its place and its representation and how we should live covered and armed with the, the armor of God because the enemy is out there. And as much as we want to ignore it, the battle is really great. And we can't do it without the Lord. We can't do it without his word. We can't do it without his armor. And he takes that little seed of thought and he turns it into a huge, huge event in our life that will change our lives forever. Look for Jesus. It said in the, our study that the Lord Jesus appears 11 times. And they say, for all Paul's emphasis on other important matter, the letter's ultimate focus is on the one who pervades its pages. So I saw that, and I think it's not just looking for the Lord Jesus, his name, and counting how many times that his name is mentioned, but it's the fact we're looking for Jesus. How Jesus, how, when Paul says something, that this is something that Jesus did, that this is something Jesus will help us with, that this is something Jesus has called us to. Because when they said it was 11 times, I thought, I wonder how many times he says God, because he says God a lot. And he says God like 37 times. His conversation, his speech is all about God and what God wants and what God has called us to and the will of God and what God is going to do. But we have that relationship with God 
through Jesus. There's no way to do all the things that Paul's instructing us to, that God wants us to, unless we have the Lord Jesus in our lives. It's impossible. But we want to be filled with God, filled with his word, filled with his knowledge, so that we will know him better and we'll know his son. And we can only do that through the son. Paul's desire for the Thessalonian church was that God would establish their hearts blameless in holiness before God the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all saints. And I am absolutely certain that I can speak for Donna, that I can speak for Jackie, that I can speak for each one of your leaders, that our desire for you is that when Jesus comes, that you will be established in holiness and blamelessness in the truth of God's word and then in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our hearts desire is for you here. This is what's kept Radiance going for so long through the pandemics and all the other things that have taken place, is our heart's desire is that you would be blameless in holiness before God and the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we pray, as we study First and the Second Thessalonians and James, that this will be a year of faith and hope and love as we walk by faith hoping for the soon return of Jesus, loving those around with the love of Jesus Christ. And we say with Paul, for who is our hope or joy or crown or boasting before the Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Are you not the glory and the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts? Yes, you are. We love you dearly. I would like to think that every woman here is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have bought a study and your desires to know the Lord more. But there is the possibility that your God has brought you here and that you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I'm telling you, it's as simple as sitting right there in your chair and saying, Jesus, will you be Lord of my life? And he will be faithful to do the rest. It's that same thing. You make a choice. You make a decision, he follows through and gives you hope and joy and peace and his word. And if you made that decision, I would encourage you to talk to your leader, to talk to your group, because you're going to need people around you. You're going to need help in the word of God. And you're going to need to know that you can't study the word of God without the Holy Spirit, who gives us understanding and wisdom and insight. They'll teach you these things, and your life will never, ever be the same. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time together. We pray as we go into group that everything we say and everything we do will glorify you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.